Hello. Hello, hello. Good morning, good morning. Howdy, howdy. How y'all doing? What's up? Riley, Chase, Deb, Forte, Thompson, Maggie. Good morning. Good morning, Missouri. <laughs> good morning, Jackie. Good morning, Miss Tiff, Antoinette, Alex. What's up, Gonzo, the found sheet brand. What's up, my friend? Good morning. How's everybody doing? Type in the comments where you're checking in from. Yes, yes. Good morning. All right. So today's Walk Talk title is Five Ways the Church Has Ignored Jesus. Now, um, just in case you are new to my ministry, my name is Matt McMillan. Good morning. Good morning, Amber. My name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books. Now, I actually have a huge announcement to make about my books. All my books are available in hardcover now. <laughs> so check them out. Um, the hardcover release, I've been putting this off and putting it off for a little over a year now, and I've been working on it in silence the past few months. It actually takes time to get that put together. It's not just, you know, um, you know, flipping a switch. You got to do quite a bit of stuff to release it in hardcover. So all my books are available in hardcover now. So my books are available in paperback, Kindle, and hardcover. Check them out. They're all on Amazon if you get some time. Now, if you've read any of my books, be sure to go back to Amazon and leave me a quick review. I would greatly appreciate that. Or wherever you purchase the book, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, go back and leave me a review. Those are always very encouraging for me. Um, I also have a podcast. I'm recording the latest episode live on Instagram. This is where I record my podcast. Thank you for joining me live. But this will be on my podcast, Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. If you're listening on the podcast, please pause the podcast. Good morning, good morning. And leave me a quick review. Um, what else? Oh, I'm also on YouTube. Check out my YouTube channel. All my past walk talks are archived on my YouTube channel. You can search any particular Bible verse, topic, maybe something you're struggling with, maybe something that you keep hearing in church and you're like, eh, that doesn't really set right with me. <laughs> I could probably help you out by getting you to refocus on who Jesus is and who you are together with Jesus. All right. Um, also, I'm not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. Nothing against people who have that title, but according to the Bible, it's not a title. So there's no qualifications listed around the word pastor. There's no authority listed. So we have given people authority who, according to the Bible, have no authority. We've given people man-made qualifications, which according to the Bible, there are no qualifications. So we are practicing what's called man-made tradition and then we are superimposing it onto the bible and saying no this is a pastor there's nothing in the bible which describes what the person with the man-made title of pastor does okay we have got to refocus on what scripture says and let it speak to us through the holy spirit within us the holy spirit speaks to us scripture backs him up not the other way around the holy spirit is eternal <laughs> <laughs> Scripture's only been around, what, 3,500 years, something like that. That's if we're including the Torah. Okay, so um, I say that in the introduction because I always want to renew your mind that you're enough. You don't have to have any formal education. You don't have to have a seminary degree. Seminaries weren't even created until the 16th century, and it was a way for the Catholics and the Protestants to become smarter than one another so they can debate each other better. And you see where that goes today. So... Just know that the spirit within you can always work in you and through you. You do not have to have a title. There are no titles in scripture. Okay. All right. Now, if you want to, Jesus said it will not be like this among us in Matthew chapter 20. So what we see today is exactly what Jesus said. It will not be like this among us. All right, now, if you wanna contact me, please do not message me on social media. To contact me, go to my website, go over to the contact page. I'll be glad to interact with you there. Okay, so let's get to today. walk talk five ways the church has ignored Jesus okay 
So here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to tell you what the five are, and then we're going to go over them. All right. <laughs> if you're if you're new to my walk talks, typically I'll have a not always, but typically I'll have a bullet point because when I sit down and I'm, you know, thinking of what this next walk talk needs to be about. I'm a creative writer. I write. I wrote books way before I started doing any type of video or audio. So I always collect my thoughts. And sometimes when I collect my thoughts, if you read my books, I do bullet points as well. <laughs> okay. So I like to keep things light, nice and neat. And um, somebody gave me a wonderful compliment last week. And he said, all of your walk talks are very succinct. And I was like, mm, thank you. Because <laughs> that's what I'm trying to go for. Okay, so here are the five, the five ways, five ways, the five ways the church has ignored Jesus. And you might not understand that. Like, what do you mean the church has ignored Jesus? I'm going to prove to you today that the church, the body of Christ is completely ignoring Jesus. And I could have came up with 50, but I just, I had, I had more than five and I whittled it down to five. So here are the five. Number one, the first way the church has ignored Jesus. The church has ignored our co-crucifixion, co-burial, and co-resurrection with Jesus. That's number one. The church has ignored our co-crucifixion, co-burial, and co-resurrection with Jesus. Completely ignored it. Okay. Number two, the church has ignored the power of the blood of Jesus. Number three, the church has ignored the completion of the old covenant, which came through Jesus. Number four, the church has ignored our new identity and our wants because of what Jesus has done to us. Our new identity and wants, W-A-N-T-S, what you want. Church has ignored our new identity and what we want because of what Jesus has done to us. Because <laughs> the church doesn't really talk about what Jesus has done to us, just for us, which is forgive us. So we're going to go over that today. All right. And then number five, the church has ignored grace, therefore ignoring Jesus. Okay. So let's get into these five. Now, um, before I dive deep into these five, it, what what we mainly see at church <laughs> is nowhere to be found in the Bible. We see a top-down authority system. That's not in Scripture. We see honorific titles. That's not in Scripture. We see one man in the church who is basically a king named Pastor. That's not in the Bible. We see uh, sub <laughs> sub authorities when we get to elders and deacons who have authority nobody has authority qualifications yes but not authority and the qualifications have nothing to do with what we've created today because there's no top-down authority structure to begin with so we have to look at scripture in a completely different way other than what man-made tradition has done to it okay now we also see a give to get system. The give to get system, you give them money, they give you money back. It's basically the church lotto. And we have gone back into the old covenant, pulled out Judaism, shoved it into the body of Christ and used this word tithe. <laughs> and on Christians are never commanded to tithe in scripture. So we see a lot of that. Now we are encouraged to give freely from the heart, not under pressure, but there's no number. But we see give to get, we see the church lotto. We see um, subjugation, where only men are allowed to do certain things, and we've taken passages, pulled them completely out of, out of context, shaken, shaken them in people's face and said, a woman, a woman can't do this, a woman can't do that, in the church. And then we see the word in the church as a building with a top-down authority structure. There's no building. <laughs> There's no top-down authority structure. The word church in the Bible is always describing the ecclesia, the body of Christ. I'm not saying don't go to a building. I'm saying the building, according to scripture, is not church. Buildings are dry. Buildings are warm. Buildings are cool when it's hot. But that's not church. So when you say in the church and you go to scripture and you pull stuff out and you say in the church right here in the church, that's not talking about what you think church is. You are regurgitating man-made tradition, which came from your 
relatives. <laughs> and then they learned it from somebody else and somebody else all the way back to the time of the Reformation. And then before that, it was muddled up as well. And I've, I've, I've dove deep into all of those topics, but I wanted to just quickly, before I get into these five ways the church has ignored Jesus, is just kind of touch on what we see in the body of Christ. It's not in the Bible. What we practice today is not in scripture. It's just not there. You would have to superimpose what the early church fathers did onto the Bible. And Jesus said, call no man father. Just because somebody has the title of church father doesn't mean they are teaching the truth. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's true. It's true if it's based on the gospel. And the early church air quote fathers, because Jesus said, call no man father, were screwing things up from the beginning. God love them, but they're humans, just like me, just like you. So a lot of this stuff started with them, and we think, oh, it's a church father, it's the truth, what do you just say to? Listen, <laughs> unless it's based on the gospel, it is error. I don't care if it's in the first century or the 21st century, it has to be based on the gospel. The church as a whole does not teach the gospel. A lot of those errors, majority of those errors started with the early church fathers, not the early church because the early church knew the gospel. And then by the time of the spinoff of the Reformation in the 16th century, they made it even worse. <laughs> it might, well, I don't know about worse, but they're, it's not based on the gospel. It's not based on the gospel. So we have to begin to read the Bible based on the actual gospel. When we don't, we ignore Jesus. And there are countless ways the church ignores Jesus, but let's get into these five. So number one, the first way the church ignores Jesus is we ignore the co-crucifixion, co-burial, co-resurrection. Now we have a air quote, holy week, where we say this is a particular holy week of the year. There's nothing holy about this week. Were there holy events that happened a couple thousand years ago? Yes, but there is no week of the year that's holy. There's no day of the year that's holy. Now, according to the law, the Sabbath was holy and that was on Saturday. Okay, and it was a way to get them to just rest. But now Christ is our Sabbath rest. We see that in scripture. God rested from his work. Now we are supposed to rest from our work. How? Through trusting Jesus. There's no holy week. There's no holy day. There's no holy land. Did you know the holy land began being called holy land because of Constantine? It's not a holy land. There's no holy land. There was only one part of planet Earth which was holy. The temple. Why was it holy? Because of the blood of the animals which were continually poured out. Holy means sanctified. So there is no particular holy place now. There is no sanctuary. Sanctuary means holy place. That's you. That's you. <laughs> All right, but we ignore our co-crucifixion. We were actually crucified on the cross with Jesus. We ignore that, but we think Holy Week is the week that we talk about Jesus being crucified. Holy Week is the week that we talk about Jesus being buried and then resurrected. resurrected. Well, guess what? The same thing happened to us. You have died. You have been crucified with Christ. Now you're alive physically, but the spirit that you were born with, which had no life of God in you, it needed life. It was born in Adam. It was crucified on the cross with Jesus. We ignore that. Buried in the tomb with Jesus. We ignore that too. How is that? We're living in the year 2024. How were we crucified on the cross, buried in the cross, or buried in the tomb? Because God is not bound by time, space, or matter. 
If God was bound by time, he would not be God. If he was bound by space, he would not be God. If he was bound by matter, he... So he, when he died on the cross, everyone who would ever believe in him was in him. Literally, your spirit was in Jesus. You were crucified on the cross with Jesus, buried in the tomb with Jesus, buried. Romans chapter 6, you were buried with Christ. You were baptized into him. The word baptized means to place inside of. And then resurrected as a brand new creation. You, When Jesus walked out of that tomb on the Sunday, you walked out of that tomb in him fully united. Romans chapter 6, you are new, your old self died, you're fully resurrected, you're a new creation. Our church ignores this, our church ignores the co-crucifixion, co-burial, co-resurrection, and then we want to hand select a particular week of the year to make a big deal of what Jesus has done, and then we can somehow stop doing something to grow closer to him. But how are you going to get any closer to him? You can't get any closer than one with 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, you are one spirit with the Lord. So we ignore that. <laughs> we ignore that. We ignore Jesus. We ignore everything that happened at the cross, in the tomb, and after the tomb when it comes to us. You know, Peter said, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day to God. So when he was crucified, you were, your spirit was literally crucified, buried. When he was buried in the tomb, you were buried in the tomb with him. And when he walked out of the tomb, you walked out of the tomb at the same time. But our church ignores that. The church ignores that. I'm talking about us. <laughs> we, you know, it's just a soft way of saying you, because I don't ignore this. <laughs> So when I say five ways the church ignores Jesus, this is number one. We ignore the, the co-crucifixion, co-burial, co-resurrection. We got to repent. We got to stop ignoring this. You're new. And that's going to be one of the other ones that I dive deep into today. Okay, number two, the second way the church has ignored Jesus. We have ignored the power of the blood of Jesus. The church has ignored the power of the blood of Jesus. It's just kind of like a, <laughs> a sacrament to certain groups and a literal consuming of it to certain groups as we take stuff out of context. Here's what the blood of Jesus has done. The blood of Jesus has saved you from the wrath of God. Romans 5, 9, you have been saved from the wrath of God because of the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has caused you to become perfect. You're perfect. <laughs> Not talking about what you do. I'm talking about who you are. This blood was offered up one time. That's Hebrews 10, 14. This blood was offered one time. Just once. The animal blood was offered up again and 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 again. And it could never cause them to become perfect. Jesus offers up his blood in the real temple in heaven. Not this man-made shadow on earth. We see this in Hebrews 9 and 10. To cause you to become perfect. 100% perfect. Oh, nobody's perfect, McMillan. You hear it all the time. But you are. But the problem is because the church ignores the power of the blood of Jesus, we tell people, you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. How can you say that? It's because they don't make a big deal out of just how powerful the blood of Jesus is and what the blood of Jesus has actually done to you. Caused you to become perfect. He has perfected you. You know, one translation says, are being made perfect? The being is not in the original text in Hebrews 10, 14. But if you still want to leave that, I don't mind that because you can apply that to people who will believe in the power of the blood of Jesus in the future. The power of the blood of Jesus has 
saved you from the wrath of God. It has caused you to become perfect. It has caused you to become 100% holy. Holy means sanctified. It's the same word. It has the same meaning. Holy and sanctified. This is why you are called a saint because you are a holy one. What's the only thing that could cause you to become holy? Blood. Hebrews chapter 13 says the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can cause you to become sanctified. He will not pour out his blood again. Progressive sanctification is saying Jesus is up in heaven on a cross, offering his blood on a cross every time I sin. That's not going to happen. This is not heavenly bookkeeping where God kind of sees you with sanctification glasses on. And, you know, yeah, I'm just, you know, I pardoned you. No, you are sanctified. You are holy. You are perfect. Why? The blood of Jesus. The church ignores that. It's just kind of a little thimble of grape juice. We got to repent. We have to make a much bigger deal out of what the blood has done. Saved you from his wrath. Caused you to become perfect. Caused you to be sanctified. By one offering, you have been sanctified. Past tense. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. You have been sanctified sanctified past tense if you want to look at scripture and say no this is a future tense sanctification passage okay but that's not you that's somebody who is going to trust jesus later on it will sanctify them you are actually sanctified <laughs> you are holy well, i mean but we can't fathom mm, calm down calm down Whew. got a little trigger right there our church does not teach this. Our church does not make much of the blood of Jesus. It is nothing. Hmm. We got to repent. What else has the blood? I could do an hour long walk talk on just the blood of Jesus, but I'm going to do just one more thing on the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has forgiven you of past, present, and future sins. Yes, future sins too. Again, where were you when Jesus was crucified? Therefore, offering up his blood in him. Therefore, all of your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. God is not bound by time. All of your sins that you would commit we're in the future when Christ died for them. Therefore, all of your future sins are forgiven as well. We are time creatures. We see things based on time. We got this planet that we're, that we're on and the planet is spinning and going around the sun. And where did the planets come from? God. So God is not bound by time. He has looked down the timeline of your life and decided i'm no longer going to hold that sin against him i'm no longer going to hold that sin against her i have forgiven them because they have trusted jesus second Corinthians 5 19 he no longer holds your sins against you why the blood hebrews 9 22 without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness is jesus repeatedly shedding his blood for your forgiveness well, I keep sinning. Well, you're forgiven. Well, this just sounds like I can just sin away. Oh, their head explodes. <laughs> they cannot grasp. They cannot grasp such a good God that he would forgive you for something that you haven't even committed yet. They think that this is some way going to cause the saints to want to now do atrocious, sinful things. They can't grasp it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's because they think that they are doing something about their sins. Repenting from it. Well, certain sins you can't repent from. How are you sure you repented well enough? What about the sins that you forget about and fly off into the rearview mirror of your life, never to be talked about again? What'd you do about that? That is demonic. Even the Hebrew people before the cross, they didn't get forgiveness sin by sin by sin by sin by sin or repentance by repentance by repentance by repentance. They received forgiveness once a year, once. 
at the day of atonement. They didn't stop, get on their knees. God, will you forgive me? They didn't do that. They knew I can't give forgiveness until I go to the day of atonement because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The church has ignored the power of the blood of Jesus. All right, let's go on to number three, the third way the church has ignored Jesus. The church has ignored the completion of the old covenant, which came through Jesus. Completely ignored it. <laughs> now, sadly, it's because of, if you want to know where this came from, it started with a man by the name of Cyprian of Carthage. He was an air quote church father. And again, as I talked about in the beginning, just because it's a church father doesn't mean that they were speaking the truth, <laughs> telling people the truth, or sticking to the gospel. And this is probably the most diabolical, one of the most diabolical original seeds that was planted by the enemy. Covenant mixture theology. So what is covenant mixture theology? So you got the old covenant, you got the new covenant. The old covenant was between God and Israel after Moses freed them from slavery in Egypt, out in the wilderness, started the old covenant. They said, we will do everything in the book of the law, all, and, all 613 commandments. They were already <laughs> breaking the first commandment before the ink had even dried, so to speak. So that's the old covenant, which includes the 10 commandments, 613 commandments. You have to do them all, all of them, all of them, 613. Deuteronomy 4, 2 says, do not add to, do not take away from. So we have no right to cherry pick the moral part. We have no right to cherry pick the tithing part. That's for the Hebrew people. Now, because of <laughs> Cyprian of Carthage, he went back into that stuff and started applying that stuff to the body of Christ because he was a Greek sophist, a philosopher. Philosophers are really good at making their points through oration. So he took that, shoved it into the gospel, first covenant mixture theologian, and it caught fire <laughs> because it is all based on what you are doing, what you are committed to doing, and God will bless you if you do this. That's how it worked in the old covenant. On this side of the cross, it does not work like that. Are you just saying we should just throw out the Bible and just cut part? No, don't throw out any part of the Bible. Leave the canon of scripture exactly as it is, but you have to read the entire canon of scripture based on what Christ accomplished. The new covenant did not begin until the cross. Why? Because blood brings in a new covenant. There is a new covenant with a new priesthood. Now, the old covenant had the old priesthood with the Levitical priests. They would do the temple work, but those priests were not perfect. They still sinned. They still had to offer up sacrifice for their own sin, and they continued to die. Jesus, calm down, McMillan. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is a king and a priest who offered his own blood who never sinned, who will never die again, who will always remain, man, I'm triggered today, who will always remain in office. This covenant began at the cross through the shedding of Jesus Christ. He finished the old covenant at the cross, but the church ignores the fact that Jesus has completed the old covenant we ignore it we say we need that we need that we need no we don't the spirit is older than the law the spirit will never lead you into immorality you don't need the law even for morality trust me it's gonna make you sin more it's gonna make you hypocritical it's gonna make you pompous it's gonna make you scary And the, you know, the main rebuttal you'll get to this is Jesus even said, Matthew 5, 17, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Yes, you forgot the, the fulfill part. He fulfilled it. John 1930, it is finished. Ephesians 2 says it's been abolished. 
Colossians 2 says it's been set aside. Look on this side of the cross. You do not need the law. If you want to use the law, go right ahead. <laughs> go ahead. See what it does to you. It is not for the righteous. If, you, if you're already righteous, you're already in Christ and you attempt to go back into the law, you attempt to use, I got to have this part of the law so I know what to do. You are putting new wine in old wineskins in your mind. You are sewing an old patch of clothing on a new garment in your mind. The wineskin's going to burst. The clothing's going to tear. You don't need it. Christ finalized the old covenant in himself at the cross, therefore fulfilling it. He came to fulfill it, and he did fulfill it. He fulfilled it in his flesh, in his very own flesh, Paul told the Ephesians. It's fulfilled. It's abolished. It's, a st it's still available. Don't get me wrong. It's available. Pull it up. Read it. Google what are the 613 commandments in the law. You can fall asleep before you finish reading all 613 and go ahead and try. Sin will be your master. Romans 614. Sin will be your master if you want to do that. Look at Romans chapter 7. You see Paul describing his past life as a devout Pharisee who delighted in the law. What happened? Sinning of every kind. <laughs> who will save me? Jesus. So the third way the church has ignored Jesus is they have ignored the fact that Christ completed the old covenant in himself. Hebrews 10 verse 9 says, he sets aside the first to establish the second. The new covenant in his name. Complete reconciliation with God by grace through faith. We are all competent to preach the new covenant. We are all competent to tell people you're completely forgiven. You're completely righteous. You are a competent minister of the new covenant. If you know what Christ has accomplished. If you don't, you're not competent. <laughs> but I say, go for it. I say, don't wait till you think you know enough before you start talking. I say, don't wait until your home life is all in order before you start talking. Don't wait until your addiction is completely gone before you start talking. I say, say it now. Tell people about Jesus now. Tell people about your complete forgiveness. Tell people about your complete righteousness. You're competent, my friend. The old covenant according to Hebrews 8.13, is obsolete. Obsolete. It actually says it is obsolete because it is weak and useless. So if you, if you want to go back and use any of it, you are using a pay phone and you got a cell phone. <laughs> you are using an 8-track and you, you got a phone. <laughs> Everything we do on our phone now. Obsolete. Go ahead. Use it. Something's better. Christ is here. Christ has come. All right, let's go on to number four, the fifth way the church has ignored Jesus. The church has ignored our new identity and what we want because of what Jesus has done to us. I know this is long. This is a long bullet point. I'm going to repeat it. The church has ignored our new identity as well as what we want because of what Jesus has done to us, to us, not for us. <laughs> you got for us, which is forgive us. You know, if Jesus just went to the cross, paid for the sin of the world, didn't come back to life, but he was the son of God, we would all just be forgiven nasty sinners who just want to go around just doing bad stuff. But the resurrection happened. When the resurrection happened, you became a new Holy Spirit of your own. You are, you are fully united, just as holy, just as righteous, just as sanctified. Why? Because you have received a new spirit. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but the life I now live. So you got your old eye. You got your new eye. You're not a limp noodle. <laughs> You're not some hollow tube and Jesus is just speaking through me. No, I'm Matt McMillan. You are you. I have Jesus in me. You have Jesus in you. You work together. It is a vine and a branch. So you have a new identity. Yeah, but I keep sinning. I'm not talking about what you do. <laughs> I'm talking about who you are. You're going to sin. Yeah, but it's a bad I don't care. It's not greater than your new identity. We do not get taught our new identity. We, we do not get taught what we want. We call people sinners and then tell them not to sin. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. And then we go to passages which are describing unbelievers and apply them to believers. We go to where Paul told Timothy, I am the chief of sinners, as he is describing his past life as the chief of the unbelievers. Persecutor of the church, dragged Christians from their homes, had papers saying he was allowed to persecute them. Paul's no longer a sinner. He's a saint. You're no longer a sinner. You're a saint. So when you sin, because you know who you now are, you can get back in track, back on track quicker because you know, okay, that's not for me. As opposed to oh, one more stick in a pile, just who I am. I'm just a nasty, rotten sinner, just a cross that I bet. No, none of that. You're a saint. You're a holy person. You are not a sinner. You have a brand new identity and you want what God wants. Second Corinthians 5.17 says you are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And you are in Christ and you are a new creation. And the old is gone and the new is here. The old's not kind of sticking his head up now and again. It's gone. Dead. This is not weekend at Bernie's where you're dragging around your old sinful self. You are a new creation who is maturing and having your mind renewed. There's nothing sinful about you at all. Yeah, but I sin. I know. We do. We sin. Uh, here's what I say. Get over it. <laughs> Stop being so focused on your sin. Focus on who you are. You'll have seasons where you sin more. You'll have seasons where you're like, oh, I'm doing a great job. None of that matters. Oh, I'm, I haven't done that. In a while. Oh, none of that. Oh, I, I really screwed up. None of that matters. When you sin, acknowledge it, learn, grow, mature. Remind yourself, that's not for me. I am a new creation. I am in Christ. I am holy. I don't want to do that. I don't want to fill in the blank. <laughs> the church ignores this because we ignore what Christ has done to us. So we got the cross, we got the forgiveness, but then we got the to us. You know, Peter said, you have, God has caused you to be born again through the resurrection. So when the resurrection happened, you were born again. You're new. You don't think like you used to. You got old pockets of coping mechanisms, but in here, you know you know who you are in here. The prophet Ezekiel before the cross, about 500, 600 years before the cross, prophesied about this. Speaking on God's behalf, he said, I will remove your heart and give you a new heart. So you got a new heart. <laughs> Romans six seventeen says you are obedient from the heart. But not just that. I will put my spirit in you. Spirit, spirit's in you. Not only that. <laughs> I will cause you to walk in my ways. So it is God who is in you. It is God who is within you. It is God who is working through your hands, feet, mouth, mind. You and the Spirit of God together, you have a new identity. You are a new creation. You have His divine nature. Second Peter 1 4 says, You have God's you have God's divine nature. What does nature mean? Natural. 
So you naturally do not want to express certain actions and attitudes. You can walk that way. Walk that way and see how it works out for you. It's not for you. You're, you're, you're a saint. You're holy. It would be like an eagle pecking on the ground like a chicken. It's not natural. What's natural for this big majestic regal bird to be flying up high, not pecking on the ground with the yard birds? Same thing with you. <laughs> but that eagle could sit down here in this grass and peck at the ground until it dies. It will still be an eagle. So you could literally commit sins until you die. You are still going to be a new creation. You cannot change it. This is the goodness of God, which teaches you how to repent out of any particular action or attitude. Not condemnation, but okay, this is not for me. Okay, I've, I've been you know, walking in this pattern for long enough. This is not for me. I'm going to choose to make new decisions. New, I'm going to make new decisions. I'm going to choose to not express that action or attitude. And you screw up again. Okay, I'm going to choose not to express that action or attitude. That's not for me. So you don't confuse who you are with what you do. You continue to mature. But our church ignores that. Our church ignores that. We call people what they aren't. And we tell them to not do what we are telling them that they are. Makes perfect sense if you don't think about it. So no, mm, calm down. Whew, I'm super triggered right now. Oh, we... Give me a second. <laughs> you know, we take, and I'm using we today as a soft way of saying you. <laughs> the same way as John when he said, if we confess our sins. Uh, John knew he didn't get forgiveness through confessing sins. He went to the Day of Atonement. You think he would go to the Day of Atonement to confession by confession by confession? This is a once for all confession of faith. Totally different walk talk, but... We take passages out of context, such as uh, deny yourself. So they call you a sinner, which you're not, you're a saint. And then they tell you to deny yourself. Well, that makes double no sense. And then we go into what Jesus said, deny yourself. And when Jesus said, deny yourself, he is setting a standard that they could not attain. He is saying, I will deny myself. Did they deny themselves? No, they scattered like the shepherd was struck and the sheep scattered. It was prophesied about and it happened. They did not deny themselves. They did not take up a cross. Who, mm, who took up a cross? You have, you have no cross. You have no cross. The disciples did not have a cross. Now, did they die on a cross? Some of them afterwards? Yes, but that was not what Jesus wanted for them. Jesus came to give them life. It was the world who killed them. Jesus is telling them, I will deny myself. I will take up my cross. Where I am going, you cannot follow. But we ignore our new identity because of what Jesus has done to us. We ignore what we want. You want what God wants. You're going to figure it out one way or the other. You're going to do immature, sinful things, being completely unfulfilled, or you're going to walk in your righteousness. You're going to figure it out, and you're still forgiven. <laughs> All right, let's go on to number five. The fifth way the church has ignored Jesus. We've ignored grace. Therefore, we've ignored Jesus. You know, grace is everything. You could do that, and I've done this. You could do a word search for the word grace in scripture, and you could replace every word where grace is with the word Jesus. You would have the same result of the scripture. Paul called 
the gospel. The gospel of grace. Acts 20, 24. The gospel of grace. The gospel means the message. The gospel is grace. There is no other message. There is no other gospel. The enemy wants to confuse different gospels for different people groups because confusion is from the devil. <laughs> the more confusing it is, the more it can get people to argue. But if it's simple, if it's graceful, he wants you to think, God forbid, grace is not fair. You cannot allow this to happen. Grace is vilified by the church vilified we have called it hyper in a negative way oh that's that hyper grace be careful with that hyper grace did you know when the word grace is used in scripture it is always used in a hyper form or else it's not even the word grace super abounding greater than anything you can ask, think, or imagine, but our church has ignored grace, vilified grace, set it aside for the bad, bad stuff. And it is Jesus. Hebrews 2, 9 says, by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for you. Sounds pretty scary. <laughs> oh, that's scary. Oh, yeah. Well, but the, stay away from that grace. Sounds dangerous. Sounds scary. Well, by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death. What? By the grace of God? What does that mean? By the grace of God, Jesus went to the cross? What? By the grace of God, Jesus was scourged and punched and spat on and just ripped to shreds and then nailed to a cross and that was by the grace of God? Yes, because you deserve that. We all do. The wages of sin is death. Every, 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 every sin. From gossip to murder. Romans chapter 1, we like to gauge sins, venial or mortal. Well, that's not that bad or that's really bad or you gotta do, 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 do. No, death? That's why grace is everything. Grace is Jesus. Grace is the gospel. But the church has ignored grace. The church has ignored Jesus as a whole. We preach more about what we have died to, what we've been taken out of, than even grace. Grace is not fair. And that's why it's so difficult for the church. We have to repent. We have to turn back to our first love in our message. Our lampstand is being removed, which is our influence. We've got to church. Grace does not cause you to sin more. <laughs> the law of Moses causes you to sin more. The commandments in the law cause you to sin more. The law is not bad, but put yourself under it. That's when you're going to sin more. Romans 6, 14. Sin will no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. Titus 2, 11 and 12. It is the grace of God which teaches you how to live an upright, holy, self-controlled life. Grace. Grace teaches you. So what's grace? This entire walk talks been based on grace. When I talked about the blood, it's based on grace. When I talked about your new identity, it's based on grace. When I talked about what you want, it's based on grace. Everything I'm talking about is based on grace because it is based on Jesus. It is based on the blood of Jesus. It's based on the life of Jesus. It is based on who you are as a new creation. Everything that I'm talking about is based on grace. 
The church must repent. Grace is our life. Grace is oxygen. Grace is not just for when you really screw up. It is for every moment in the same way you were saved, which is by grace. Now walk in it, which is by grace. Man, we can't grasp this. Grace will wash your feet. Grace eats meals with people who are about to betray him. Grace calls people out of the tomb, stinking with grave clothes on, pulling them off. <laughs> Grace walks on water and then invites you out to walk on water with him. Grace forgives your past, present, and future sins. Grace forgives the people who are nailing him to a cross. Grace cooks breakfast for the people who deny him three times and completely abandon him. Grace, Grace never leaves you. Grace never forsakes you. Grace will never dishonor you. Grace will keep no records of your wrongs. Grace will always be committed to you. Grace is not worried about your commitment. Grace is your everything. And the church has got to repent. Uh, grace is Jesus. Jesus is grace. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, so, I hope this has encouraged you today. I hope it's brought to light some truth. And you should always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. There's nothing wrong with you. And you are awesome. So always tell the truth about yourself. Always be yourself. Love y'all.